Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's seminar to be given by Ekaterina Muliarova on the topic of comparing legal cultures, global constitutional values as a point of reference in national legal systems. And we have been very happy to have Ekaterina here over the last academic year. Um, and she is the head of the Legal Center at the Heritage Institute in Moscow. Uh, she graduated with distinction, I should mention, from the law faculty of the Moscow Lomonosov State University in 2006. And she holds the degree of Doctor of Jurisprudence from Universität Regensburg, to which she also has a long-standing affiliation. In 2007 until 2009, she was a postdoc Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, and she has also held uh, a scholarship of the Columbia University of the European University Institute for the participation in the summer schools and of the Hague Academy of International Law. During her studies, she also completed trainings at the European Parliament and at the European Court of Justice. Currently, she is also affiliated with the law faculty of the Moscow State University. Ekaterina's focus, her research focus, that is, is on European law, comparative law, and public international law. She is interested in normative transition and means of judicial enforcement of global normative standards. And she has a keen interest in very topical normative issues that reveal the social essence of law and indeed the relation between law and culture. And that makes her research also stretch across the social sciences and humanities in a very interesting fashion. Among her publications is a monograph in German on sovereignty and concepts of integration in the Russian doctrine in the context of the European Union, published in 2006. She has published on the European neighborhood policy and EU enlargement, and on several issues of comparative law, such as energy relations, surrogacy, and new reproduction technique and landscape policies. And one of her recent publications, uh, just recently appeared, I believe, is on surrogacy regulation in Russia and responses to European case law. And it appeared in the Italian Journal of Public Law, or is very soon to appear. Um, and during her residence here at SCAS, over the last, or still, <laughs> academic year, she works on a project comparing legal cultures and global normative values as a point of reference in national legal systems. And I believe it is this research that we're going to hear about. Very happy to have you here, Katarina. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction, Christina, and thank you for your generous and friendly support um, during this year, year. This has been a very happy year. All the stuff, thank you so much for your almost invisible presence, which made our stay here so effortless and pleasant. And all dear fellow fellows, thank you so much for your talks, your jokes, and your engagement. Uh, my growing research interest in the recent years has been comparative social-legal analysis of law, which is, of course, quite a multi-dimensional subject matter. Coming from the dogmatic legal scholarship, I must admit that professional legal language is very often obscure and abstract. Additionally, legal scholarship wears an old hat, what is known as a gap between law in books and law in practice. So I've spent this year at SCAS being concentrated on multidisciplinary interpretations of law, looking for inspirations from other disciplines and insights that can animate purely legal studies. And I'm extremely grateful for this tremendous luxury of time, resources, and support I received here in Sweden from the University of Uppsala and the SCAS. I'm talking today about global norms uh, and international norms in their reflection in national legal systems. In a wider sense, it's a question of interaction between international and national legal orders, and what this kind of reflection might indicate about differences uh, in legal cultures. 
So I'd like to start on a personal note and to give you some information on the background of my research interest in comparative legal analysis, which is driven by very close historical and normative events I myself was able to witness. Being born in a very different social, political, and legal order, namely the one of the Soviet Union, I lived a short part of my life under the 1977 Soviet Constitution, which inter alia proclaimed that citizens of the USSR are equal before the law without distinction of origin, social, property status, race or nationality, sex, education, language, attitude to religion, type and nature of occupation, domicile or other status. The equal rights of citizens of the USSR are guaranteed in all fields of economic, political, social, and cultural life. Citizens of the Soviet Union are guaranteed freedom of speech, of press, of assembly, meetings, street processions, and demonstrations. They are also guaranteed the inviolability of the person so that no one may be arrested except by a court decision. Judges and people assessors are independent and subject only to the law. So as you can see, the Soviet Constitution was almost a perfect sample of democratic normative ideas. When the Soviet law was substituted by the new one in 9193, it appeared that though many words of the Soviet Constitution were the same or almost the same as those of liberal constitutions of the West, the system, however, was different. In 1993, Russian state enacted a new liberal constitution which proclaimed democratic basis of the Russian statehood and its belonging to the world community. In Article 17, the constitution recognized and guaranteed rights and freedoms of man and citizen according to the universally recognized principles and norms of international law and according to the present constitution. It also dec declared adherence to universally recognized and norms and principles of international law. It says that if an international treaty or agreement of the Russian Federation fixes other rules than those envisaged by law, the rules of international agreement should be applied. So in this way, in 1993, the Russian state recognized that its legal order is open to the universal norms and principles of international law and that the Russian constitution even creates a legal mechanism for maintaining such openness. Namely, it secures the supremacy of international law principles in case of their conflict with domestic rules. So the, this initial act involved an all-embracing reform of the legal system. There have been several uh, further institutional uh, channels for reform and uh, transformation. So in 91, Russia became legal successor of the Soviet Union and the Security Council, and being a member of the Council of Europe since 1996, Russia recognized the obligatory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. So the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights are binding for the Russian Federation and is a well-established channel for harmonization in the areas co covered by the com Convention. In 1994, partnership and cooperation agreement between the European communities and the Russian Federation envisaged some principles and mechanisms upholding desirable Western liberal norms and values and promoting de democratic governance. What is important from a comparative perspective, I think, is the fact that the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement was based on two principles, namely the most favored nation clause and the principle of non-discrimination and equal treatment. It's finally quite importantly, Article 55 of the PCA provided for approximation of Russian legal norms with the EU standards. The agreement established a regular political dialogue and support for transition to market-orientated uh, system and democracy based on human rights. Therefore, there have been explicit channels for transformation through European values. The collapse of the Soviet bloc in the 90s offered a new opportunity to introduce global constitutional standards into the legal system of the newly independent states and to challenge political reform. In a broader perspective, the whole European continent has experienced total transformation. Several major political and legal events happened shaping the new normative landscape of Europe. The community of independent states between Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine was created in 1991. Most of the former states of the Soviet Union signed new partnership and cooperation agreements with the European communities. And additionally, the European communities created full-scale programs of financial support and technical assistance for reforms and transitions. So since 1991, TASIS, 
program has committed 2.7 billion euros for programs in Russia and distributed over 1.6 billion. The former socialist countries also received financial aid from most significant international donors, including the World Bank and the World Bank of Reconstruction and Development. The Eastern Enlargement of the European Union was called by Joschka Fischer a plan with no political alternatives. In 1993, um, so-called Copenhagen uh, criteria for accession and EU membership were formulated by the European Council. They included the obligation to incorporate the whole body of the EU law, so-called acquis communautaire, provide stability of institutions, guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights, a functioning market economy, and the, uh, the treaties also allowed for gradual harmonization of national laws of the new member states with the European acquis. The conditionality of the EU membership has had a main impact on rapid transformation of legal systems and economic reforms in the accession countries of the Central and Eastern Europe. The influence of the European Union in pushing forward transformation in the Central and East European states cannot be overestimated. Making the transition from a communist model to a democratic one after 1989 required an attractive image of the possible future. Europe in general, and the EU in particular, has become such a model in most of the countries of the former Soviet bloc. For certain East and Central European countries, the clear goal of the EU membership and support on the part of the EU towards structural changes in the society has served as an effective promoter of transformation. Transformation in Eastern Europe has mainly been understood as a process of convergence with West European principles, norms, and constitutional models, in which the constitutional models of the established democracies of the West were transplanted to the newly emerged states. One of the most important aspects of the perception of the idea of rule of law in Eastern Europe during historic transition in the 80s and 90s was its, its external or its international dimension. Society had to be based on the idea of law, not any law, but one conforming to certain principles, requirements, and standards which existed outside that particular society in the international sphere in countries perceived as normal, as models of the Reichstag. Of course, uh, there have been other major events um, within the European Union, like the adoption of the Charter for Fundamental Rights, but I'm not going to mention this uh, in more detail. So I want to draw your attention to two changes. Firstly, the last wave of transitions in the Central and Eastern Europe, may, uh, many of national constitutions have imported constitutional norms from abroad. In classical legal scholarship, we thought of a constitution as a national product reflecting history, traditions, aspirations, and normative culture of this or that particular country. Nowadays, constitutional ideas migrate and global constitutional values have become a point of reference in national legal systems. This process, of course, not entirely new. Legal reform by legal transplantation has been an important concept in the theory of normative innovation. Desirability of harmonizing laws roots in fundamental legal promise of equality, certainty, and uniformity. However, in the process of European integration in particular, we witnessed the unprecedented opening of national constitutions towards international and supranational normative principles and the integration of national constitutions into the system of multi-level constitutionalism. Secondly, Internationalization of domestic law and implementation of the provisions of international covenants, such as European Convention of Human Rights or the Treaty of European Union International Law, have created a system of international standards, norms, and a distribution of authority which didn't exist in this form before and provided for high level of penetration of national norms into national legal systems. What are the critical consequences of these processes? In particular, of particular relevance, I think, is the fact that the nation state has been losing control over the use of public power, both in international relations and domestically. Not only nationally elected parliaments and national authorities can now decide upon domestic political issues, but supranational institutions and international uh, but also supranational institutions and international norms interfere, so to say, international legal orders. The sovereign sta uh, nation state was presumed to determine the use and constraint of state power. In the context of multinational 
uh, governance, the relationship between sovereign states have changed, bringing the transformation of the notion of sovereignty. In addition, transnational governance caused changes in the legal position of the individual, who now received an access to law at the international level. Human rights have received a horizontal dimension that means that rights became binding in the private sphere and regulate not only the conduct of governmental actors and their dealings with private individuals, but also relations between private individuals themselves. This new trend, namely of transplantation of normative models and internationalization of constitutional law significantly, significantly shaped the role distribution between national and supranational legal orders. Absence of great power conflict and the East-West divide has transformed not only world politics but equally international law. What we need to explain now is stability and peace, says Professor Zakaria. The end of the Cold War, the fall of Berlin Wall, economic and cultural globalization have created new demand for international law and facilitated its realization. The proliferation of international law, in other words, can be viewed as a product of a changed structural context, greater ideological convergence, and greater functional need. Transitions to constitutional democracy in Eastern and Central Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, followed by the widespread constitution making in the 90s, propelled the rapid growth and expansion of the field of comparative constitutional law. They also resumed discussion upon methodological issues. The reshaped configuration between differences and uniformity in international relations called for new theoretical perspectives. It seemed that the explanatory power of the classical constitutional theory has been diminishing. Trying to explain the current dynamics of normative processes, classical comparative law has been searching for new intellectual tools and interpretational keys. So as a famous professional joke states, free lawyers have four opinions on the same matter. So as you can see here, what we can say about multidisciplinary uh, approaches. But I'd like uh, today particularly mention empirical quantitative turn in comparative law. Uh, the powerful quantitative empirical approach suggested the realization of global harmonization, truly global perspective. It has been suggested that there is a typical style of liberal constitutionalism. In the wake of the World War II, liberal constitutionalism emerged as a default design choice for political systems across Europe and North America. It then diffused more widely across the globe as a whole and was viewed as the default governance option at the end of history. Though liberal constitutionalism has never been perfectly or universally implemented, the aspiration remained. The empirical trend in comparative constitutional law is concerned with constitutional performance and ways of assessing it. The logical question whether this paradigm is therefore what counts as constitutional success. Some scholars claim that comparative legal scholarship lag behind the social sciences in their ability to trace causal links among variables. Although intellectual interest in international migration of constitutional ideas has been growing steadily over the last decade, the field of comparative law remained under theorized. Problem-driven, interference-orientated scholarship is still difficult to come by, says Jan Hirschl. I believe this trend vividly reflects the intellectual approach and normative language of modernity. It is a notable example of, of appropriation of scientific language in law and legal scholarship and yet another attempt to master the gap between law and books and law and practice by finding best possible solution and best constitutional design that ensure effective and functioning democracy. In this way, the focus on universality reiterates law claim to a scientifically knowledgeable objectivity able to predict and to control the development of social re reality. Investigating how national constitutional histories and constitutional change are tied in the design of the constitution, the proponents of quantitative empirical approach resort to evolutionary biology. The explanatory power of design versus environment is comparable as suggested by Professor Alkins, Ginsburg, and Melton to the classical behavioral debate in biology that pits the forces of nature versus those of nurture. The design or nature of the constitution, unlike the human DNA, 
is very much a product of human engineering, whereas the constitutional environment, unlike biologist nurture, is, a, is less manipulable of the two sets of factors. This reversal shifts scientific priorities. With respect to both human and constitutional mortality, it's more imperative to understand those conditions we can do something about than those we cannot. Explanatory power of design versus environment is a, is a crucial distinction distinction with highly normative implications. I should mention, of course, that several prominent scholars have heavily criticized this approach. Oh, the best thing to see what the methodology looks like is to apply it to practice. The method seeks to overcome and to exclude arbitrary judgments and to minimize the influence of subjective factors, maintaining cri uh, critical distance from dogmatic interpretation. I would like to illustrate it with a recent case, namely with a much contested judgment by the Russian Constitutional Court, number 21 of July 14, 2015, that provides an eloquent illustration of how enforcement of global norms is realized in Russia. This decision is particularly interesting because the Russian Constitutional Court makes direct reference to foreign decisions, which is normally not the case, since the competence of the Constitutional Court is to interpret the national constitution. So there has been uh, much discussion on the constitutional aspects of the case, and I was interested um, to look at the case comparatively. So you, uh, you, you have the table, but you, you will also see the table here. So the table has five parts and divided into four cells, juxtaposing arguments of the Russian Constitutional Court, uh, German Federal Constitutional Court, Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Italian Constitutional Court, Corte Constitutionale, the Austrian Constitutional Court, and finally, the British Supreme Court. Um, arguments made by the Russian Constitutional Court are represented uh, on the vertical axis and corresponding decisions of the European courts on the horizontal axis. Some decisions like Zolange um, deal with the uh, legal order of the European Union, some other with uh, international law norms, uh, some with the mechanism of European Convention of Human Rights, so with different, uh, uh, different systems of international and supranational law. In this much disputed decision, the Russian Constitutional Court activated its competence for review based on the interpretation of its international obligation and competence-related collisions between the Russian Constitution and the law integrated from the Council of Europe. As the official resume of Ruling 21, um, says the contested question was whether a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights passed on the complaint against Russia and placing obligations on the state, realization of which does not conform to the constitution of the Russian Federation should be executed by the state bodies of the Russian Federation. The constitutional court came to the conclusion that the judgment of the ACHR could not be executed. In adjudicating its right to decide on constitutional matters which are in conflict with the European Convention of Human Rights and interpretation by the European Court of Human Rights, the Russian Constitutional Court progressed in several steps. First, the court raised the central question of uh, mandatory effect and supremacy of the ECHR decisions in the national order. Further, the court discussed the issue of the hierarchy of norms and conflicts between constitutional norms and obligations um, under international treaties, thus focusing on the transfer, transfer of sovereign rights to international organizations and the opening up of the state sovereignty. Furthermore, uh, Russian constitutional court dealt with the sub subsidiarity of the CHR mechanism and the margin of appreciation doctrine, specifying a framework for harmonization of national laws with international standards. In the next step, I'm going to go back to the first slide and discuss this in more detail. In the next um, step, um, the, uh, the court elaborated on the limits to opening up state sovereignty and on sovereign equality being a use cognis principle in international law, which is a fundamental principle of international law. So finally, the uh, Russian Constitutional Court stressed significance of the core principles of the national constitution, the central role of constitutional values, the identity of the constitutional order asserting its right to balancing test. So first of all, from the perspective of comparative law, case law is a notable illustration of how legal approximation works through judicial practices. 
different national courts have to decide on the relationship between national constitution and supranational uh, norm. The fundamental reason is that universal is not equal to uniform. The table shows that there can be much consensus on the base, uh, basic constitutional principles, but little consensus of how and why this principle should be applied. As some of the commentators contend, when the principles come to be applied, the appearance of commonality disappears. So in yet another respect, we can conform, confirm that all national authorities have to deal with, this, with the same challenges. Selective strategic excitation of foreign precedents and authorities uh, rather often occurs in transnational settings. However, it's sometimes done in the course of constitutional adjudication to emphasize the soundness of its own decision. So let us now take a more detailed look at the table. So I'm going back to the first one. It has been very difficult to squeeze like enormous uh, case analysis into a very small uh, table. So this is a very, very reduced version of actually original research. So, but um, I thought it would be important to have uh, some uh, case analysis uh, discussed with you. So the, uh, so the limits of mandatory effect of decisions of the European Court of Human Rights is a problem that is well known in many European countries. Why and how far international norms are mandatory for domestic legal orders? The binding force of decisions made by international courts is given effect in national law on some substantial and some procedural conditions. Substantially, supranational decisions may not contradict with certain national legal principles. This can include, for example, the level of protection of fundamental rights, binding force of law and justice, fundamental principles of the state constitutional order, separation of powers principle. Lack of necessary qualities like clarity of the arguments can withdraw decisions mandatory effect. The Russian Constitutional Court relies on the comprehensiveness of the decision. Should the interpretation of the European Convention by the ECHR be less full and more restrictive than the system of protection under the Constitution of the Russian Federation, so the Russian Constitutional Court is not able to endorse the decision of the ECHR. The critical point, however, uh, is that the court doesn't explain in detail what is the fullness or restrictedness uh, mean. The terminology used by the Russian Constitutional Court in this respect creates uncertainty about the implementation of, implementation of the ECHR decisions. So the next question is how international norms can reach domestic legal orders. In classical international law, a state is presumed to be a sovereign of its territory, and it's up to its will to open its sovereign legal order to external influences. Internal validity and application, as well as possible internal supremacy of international treaties, as the German Constitutional Court explained in Zolange, do not follow directly from general international law, which contains no general rule that states are obliged to incorporate their treaties into domestic law. International norms are incorporated into national law through different mechanisms. Some legal orders require a translation procedure, an act of national legislature implementing international norms. Some other jurisdictions, like the Russian one, follow a strict version recognizing direct effect of international treaties in domestic law. This is the Article 15 of the Constitution, which I mentioned at the beginning. Once international norms are incorporated into national legal system, they are assigned a certain position in the hierarchy of legal acts. The hierarchical relation of constitutional and international legal norms was treated by all equivalent courts. The German constitutional order assigns a rank of federal laws to the norms of the ECHR, so does the Italian constitutional law. In Austria, the convention enjoys the status of the constitution. In the United Kingdom, international treaties are implemented by acts of the parliament. And as I mentioned already, the Russian constitution assigns supremacy to the norms of international treaties and direct validity. So let us now look what happens to supranational courts in national legal system. What positions do they occupy in relation to national courts? Most of the decisions 
make a clear separation of competences in the multi-judicial systems of review. So the European Court of Human Rights has competence to interpret the European Convention, interpretation of uh, and application of national legal norms is the competence of national judges. So the uh, Italian Constitutional Court, for example, says that it cannot be denied the competence to, access uh, to assess compliance with the Italian Constitution. In Zolange, the Federal Constitutional Court demonstrates a functional interlocking of jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice and those of the member states. The central concept in delimiting uh, two spheres of competence is the margin of appreciation doctrine. The, margin of, uh, the term margin of appreciation refers to the space for maneuver that supranational organs are willing to grant national authorities in fulfilling their obligations under international law. Given the diverse cultural and legal traditions embraced by each member state, it's often difficult to identify uniform European standards. The margin of appreciation is understood as a dynamic, flexible concept needed to balance sovereignty and obligation under international treaty. Its interpretation is guided by several principles developed by courts, including the principle of proportionality, necessity, legitimate basis for action. So for example, in, in the UK case, the white for the margin of appreciation was uh, related to the voting rights for prisoners and proportionality principle. In practical terms, the main conflict between the Austrian constitutional law and the provisions of the convention involved the traditional system of review by administrative organs in Austria and the convention requirement to introduce a judicial system of protection in every field of state action. So this requirement contrasted with the Austrian constitution and therefore the Austrian constitutional court required for a wider margin of appreciation. But uh, this doctrine is context dependent and its limits can be drawn only within a specific case. So the next uh, crucial issue, once the sovereign order is open to supranational norms, how the limits should be defined. And the limits of opening of state sovereignty play a crucial role in the relationship between domestic law and supranational norms. There's a certain minimum state sovereign immunity which cannot be shared or transferred to international institutions. I want to draw your attention to significant differences taken by the high courts. So in determining limitations of mandatory fact of European decision, the Russian Constitutional Court makes clear that international obligation does not mean waiving state sovereignty, applying the supremacy, autonomy, and independence of state power. Bundesverfassungsgericht involves such notions as identity of the constitutional order, its basic framework, and its very structure. The Italian court makes reference to the system of protection of fundamental rights. The British Supreme Court underlines the separation of powers as the line to be observed. The Austrian court says that the changes made by supranational norms may not be substantially equal to constitutional amendment. I should say that in practice, the limits of opening upstate sovereignty can be measured using the enforcement of supranational norms in domestic legal orders in case of collision. The question of limits is directly connected to definition of core principles of the constitution and constitutional values. The value-based approach permits the whole line of reasoning ma made by the high courts. Well, whilst referring to constitutional identity, values and national traditions of the state, the high courts do not always comprehensively lay down the detailed understanding of this concept presented in a rather abstract way. In the national system of check and balances of the Austrian state organization, traditionally the administration decides on many matters which are normally decided by courts. The Italian court refers to the principle of equality and solidarity which occupy a privileged position as national constitutional values Effective democracy is identifi identified by the British Supreme Court as a central value in the United Kingdom, and sovereignty is an essential characteristic of the Russian Federation and its constitutional legal status, says the Russian Constitutional Court. The most developed interpretation is given by the Bundesverfassungsgericht. The fundamental constitutional value is a certain level of protection of human rights, which is guaranteed under the Grundgesetz. It includes 
um, a legitimately elected parliament and a catalog of human rights, but also a certain system of protection of individual rights uh, by independent court, courts, which are given an adequate jurisdiction and on the basis of a proper procedure, as well as an adequate and effective sanctions for the infringement of fundamental rights. So therefore, uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht concentrated really on procedural aspect of um, uh, uh, constitutional values. So this comparison show, shows approximation often happens through, through an uneasy dialogue between traditional values and modern challenges of globalization. And the problem of interaction between international and national norms can be only partially reserved. In a globalized context dealing with similar challenges, constitutional courts worldwide increasingly rely on comparative constitutional jurisprudence to frame and articulate their own position in a given constitutional context. Uh, this was, of course, a uh, comparison uh, made to a very <coughs> modest scale without any uh, computerized uh, methods uh, manually, so to say, but I think that data present presented in this, uh, in this way, presented neutrally, so to say, help to examine the attitudes and national normative responses to international influences. So the focus on universals, I believe, uh, can therefore inform also our understanding on differences. So, and I think, uh, I mean, there has been really a lot of discussion of this case in, in the Russian context, but uh, I think, I mean, this, this is a bit of original research I'm presenting, so no one did actually comparison between uh, original argumentations of, of different courts. So uh, how national judges interpret conflicting supranational norms is an indicator of the willingness of the domestic order to integrate into a global system of power and to accept public authority beyond the state. More precisely, some truly fundamental principles of law or the essence of its constitutional order could theoretically prevent a state from harmonizing its law with supranational normative standards. However, the critical point is not the reference to national tradition itself, but elaboration, what this tradition precisely is, and the level of elaboration. So how to explain uh, the formal adherence to a particular form of liberal constitutional design and reluctance to implement it in practice and to develop robust democracy. It is evident that mere existence of formal rules is not sufficient for an effective constitutional process. International traffic of uh, legal ideas reflects the belief that with the introduction of formal elements of democracy and legal pillars of market economies, a happy end to the transition would have followed. 25 years later, it is clear that the results of legal harmonization and legal reforms and the ability of the Western type law to induce stable political change are far from the ideal. It is acknowledged by many scholars that nowadays liberal constitutionalism is not an accurate description of the dominant constitutional style around the globe. Professional literature booms with all sides of, uh, kinds of definitions trying to catch up the peculiarity of current state of global and national constitutional law. <laughs> Democratorship, hybrid democracies, authoritarian constitutionalism, democracy a la Russe, gray states, and so on. The efforts to dislodge law from its social and cultural context and to create unified global normative space have been enormously amplified since the second half of the 20th century. Nevertheless, many scholars contend that the attempt of modernity to contrast the relationship between law and society in rational manner is not without limits. It has been argued that the practice of law cannot be decontextualized to the same degree as other disciplines and has never been made scientific to the same extent. But what about the context? What context actually mean? Это пишется в России, в которой уже вовсю процветает столыпинская реакция, а реакция по точному слову Мережковского, это не наносное у нас, не временное, это плоть и кость наша. Это слово в собственном смысле у нас неприменимо. Реакция всегда реагирует на что-то, а у нас реакция это основа государственной жизни. Только во время нее что-то и происходит, и делается. 
So he, he Dmitry Bukov, a well-known journalist, novelist, teacher, and a public figure, is discussing the state of affairs in today's Russia. And he quotes Dmitry Mereshkovsky, who wrote in 1909, that the reactionary state of mind is not for us something superficial or temporary. It is our flesh and bone. This word can never be applied literally to us. The reactionary ideology always responds, reacts to something. And in Russia, such reactionary state is not posturing, is not temporary, but is the foundation of public life. Only during such times, something actually does happen or is achieved here. Here, as topical as it was 100 years ago, it is now, and clearly shows that certain things are deeply rooted in historical and cultural context and can be simply explained by presence of legal norms. But um, how do we explain differences in legal terms? How much differences, difference is allowed? What level of convergence is required? What about differences in nat national identity, state structure, ideology? Uh, these issues become subject to polemic. And though the, in normative borrowings, cu cultural norms are connected to uh, global systems of economic exchange, power relations, and systems of meaning, they are locally expressed. The relationship between law and culture becomes deeply problematic in situations involving legal transplants when the law appropriated from one society to another. Attitudes towards legal transplants illustrate the interaction between competing normative logics and therefore represent contact zones between globalized norms and the domestic legal culture. Differences in legal cultures and traditions affect the effectiveness of transplant, transplants. So distrust towards global ideas and solutions can be an important factor influencing the effectiveness of transplanted models. There are different typologies of normative transplants all reflecting different forms uh, of interaction between global norms and domestic legal culture. In the mid-90s, uh, Gian Maria Iani shared his interpretation of legal transplants in the Central and Eastern Europe, arguing that the choice of Western models has ha had happened by chance and prestige, where prestige substituted ideology. Legal transplants theory suggests that constitutional rights can diffuse through four mechanisms, coercion, competition, learning, and acculturation. So borrowing, assimilation, integration, harmonization, convergence, chance, prestige, expansion, appropriation, vandal durch Ernährung, which is change through rapprochement, uh, all different models of interaction between uh, uh, global normative standards and uh, national uh, legal cultures. So built upon the interest in the environment in which the legal system operates, social sciences develop different forms and methods of contextualization. These take into account the social, historical, economic, and political factors, which are in contrast, uh, con constant interaction with law and legal instruments. As Pierre Legrand argues, rule Rules and concepts alone actually tell one very little about a given legal system. They may provide one with much information about what is apparently happening, but they indicate nothing about the deep structures of legal systems. Specifically, rules and concepts do little to disclose that legal systems are but the surface manifestations of legal cultures and indeed of culture to the core. So we looked at judicial practice as an example of uh, competing normative approaches to demonstrate how deeply even highly autonomous supranational systems of law and legal choices can be embedded in the normative tradition and broader historical processes. I would like to provide a second example illustrating institutional development in Eurasia. The transfer of Western liberal ideas and foreign legal transplants in Russia since ever have been seen as an instrument of legal reform and a channel for creating social change. The transformation in Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall was understood as Europeanization, a process of structural change variously affecting actors and institutions, ideas and interests, as a matter of cultural diffusion, a process of institutional adaptation, and as the adaptation of policy and policy processes. For Russia, transformation associated with a vision of pluralistic Europe, 
diverse social systems and state orders can coexist peacefully and united in the pan-continental community characterized by the end of the Cold War and underlying strategic contestation between East and West. The termination of ideological conflict between capitalist democracy and revolutionary socialism provided for the emergence of Europe as an independent actor in the world stage. It was a dialogical model of New Europe which was based on transformative agenda, transformation associated with creating of the new common European home as announced in the Charter for a New Europe. Regrettable that Russia's logic of transformation was confronted against the European logic of enlargement. Unfortunately, the attempts to reconcile these two different logics were met with certain reluctance and different agenda, which is in, in its turn led Russia accusing the West of the double standards. Nevertheless, Russia has never announced its aspiration for some sort of greater European arrangement. In 2014, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus signed a treaty on the Eurasian Economic Union, which deepens ties between the three countries, which already created a customs union in 2010 and should guarantee free movement of goods, services, capital, and workers. The aim of the union is to coordinate policy for major economic sectors and to integrate the internal markets of the member state. The European Union has become a classical reference model of success, and the Russian officials are very open in their references to the EU. So, for example, the president of the uh, Commission, Viktor Kristenko, mentions that uh, the Commission studies very carefully experiences of the European Union, not only as the main partner of the Eurasian Union, but as a model of integration union. The Minister in Charge for Microeconomic Questions and Inter Integration, Tatiana Valavaya, touched upon the possible enlargement of the Eurasian Union, saying that EU experiences have been studied carefully and the Eurasian Union is not rushing for the enlargement of its own sake. Only a common unifying idea can rally any integration union. So President Putin talking about integration in Eurasia touched upon precisely the same question and referred to common cultural traditions of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. The research demonstrates that a political regime in Russia used specific strategies and specific combination of legitimizing claims to stay in power. Involvement in a global normative system is a possibility to access a new source of power and legitimacy. Appropriation of normative models can, however, take a form of resistance, including interpretations that disrupt the translating relationship of power. In the words of Pushkin, Petr, Peter the Great cut a window from Russia to Europe. In order to cut this window, Peter created, had to build a wall separating Russia from Europe, as Boris Ospensky notes. Even more importantly, Peter created a cultural contrast between Russia and Europe, which didn't exist previously. And it is not by chance that Peter proclaimed Russia after the reforms to be a new country. It is notable that he begins with adoption of the science, so the forms of European culture, obviously presuming that the content should follow the form. Such performances obviously demonstrate a proclivity towards Europe, a desire to be European. At the same time, they create a contrast between Russia and Europe. What are implications of uh, such a pragmatic borrowing uh, of uh, foreign models? If tradition, uh, traditional normative conventions are not fully embedded, I believe they have a topian character. So they are based not on what it is, but on what it should be. And in legal sphere, they are replaced with pure legal formalism. This particular normative model, I believe, also have very important implications for the domestic context. Using traditional upside-down strategy for inducing social change, which is consistent with traditional political functions of the, so, uh, of the state, Russia reproduces through liberal prism the normative legal culture of the Soviet times. The way citizens use the law and the way they interact with public institutions is crucial for reprodu reproducing social context. Law turns people into legal subjects. The model of Euro Eurasian integration strives to strengthen economic subjects of law, leaving the democratic deficits of the governance system and the ultimate goal of the rule of law and political unification undressed. So this has been, of course, the main aim of uh, European uh, 
uh, integration and the main idea of the Schuman Declaration after the Second World War. So I'd like to conclude by asking three questions. So why to compare, how to compare, so what to compare, how to compare, and why to compare. So I provided some examples, examples related to Russia, the situation which I, of course, understand better. But uh, while being here, I found extremely interesting material on Scandinavian legal third and very interesting practices related to implementation of international norms in Sweden, for example. And I will be very much willing to share um, uh, this uh, information and this research with my colleagues uh, in Russia, and I think it will be very interesting for Russian public. Uh, I didn't have enough time to illustrate in detail how uh, comparative law is able to accommodate bottom-up approaches to legal transformation and responses of various actors and institutions to changing normative reality, different cultural attitudes to certain topical issues like wrongdoing at work, surrogacy practices, expressions of public interest and solidarity. I tried to exemplify several methods of comparison. I think they all have a right to life. I believe it's important that all the methods are inform informed historically because we learn from history. And I also think that any comparison involves translation and current trend to internationalization of constitutional law and to stressing analogies and convergences increases the likelihood of being lost in translation. I believe we all need to find a common language at any moment to be able to negotiate and to communicate. And I would like to conclude by quoting Jonathan Sunton, who just have said in the annual Reed lecture, law is an expression of our collective collective values. It's an alternative to violence and despotism. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katerina, for this very rich and interesting lecture. So now we open up for comments and questions. Yeah, you know I was going to ask a question. Um, so I wanted, I, I was very interested by, with your slide where you, you gave the Copenhagen criteria and among uh, other things, one of the three bullet points was something called a functioning market economy. And so what I wanted to do was to raise the issue of how the world of business and markets figures into the discussion that you've just laid out because historically uh, among the heaviest users of any legal system was the business community. They always litigate with each other, they collect debts, they are often very interested in the rule of law. They care a lot about harmonization and sanctity of contract, so they're a real constituency for, for law. And in the historical background, there's this thing called the Lex Mercatoria, which was this body of, of mercantile law that's been developed, and which I think in some ways has found ways to finesse some of the problems that you, you lay out, the problem of legal pluralism, for example. So in, if you look at how uh, uh, commercial law works, uh, a lot of contracts have choice of law clauses. So rather than worry about in what jurisdiction are, is our tra transaction gonna occur and what do the Russians think and what do the South Africans think, they simply stipulate that the law that applies to our contract will be New York City law or London law, and they basically ignore all this other stuff. Uh, sometimes they will opt out of legal systems altogether by putting in a binding arbitration clause, which basically says, don't worry about what laws ap apply anywhere. It, it doesn't matter, we're gonna avoid a legal system altogether. And then there's examples where the commercial uh, community itself creates what you would call its own private law. It creates an, its own set of standards, and they're not claiming to be a sovereign power, but it kind of doesn't matter. They're governing, you know, massively valuable transactions, and so the uh, International Swaps and Derivatives Association has basically created a body of private law to govern uh, derivatives markets globally. So, and, and, and they're very mindful of, of transplant effects, and so I think a lot of what you say is true, um, but I think there's this community that has a great interest in in globalization, in, in issues of sovereignty, and the way in which they've dealt with it as a practical matter is to try to run away from a lot of this stuff and to find ways to avoid it and to work around it. 
And so I just was interested in your reaction to that observation. Children, yeah. Thank you very much for <laughs> always very interesting, very structured questions. Um, well, I agree with everything you said, and um, I think that uh, practical application of uh, civil law, commercial law principles uh, uh, works in a little bit different manner as uh, uh, the principles of the public law, but uh, the Copenhagen criteria, which I mentioned, um, had to do with the liberalization of markets and uh, actually founding the conditions for, for the situation you have just described. So in, um, as far as I know, for example, in um, 2005, I think in Russia, the courts proceed, uh, proceed over 5 million civil law cases. And uh, there is a vast applicability of foreign law in transnational legal contracts. So the idea of um, criteria for accession in the, in the case of Central East European countries or liberalization of private law in Russia had to do with creation of foundational basis for this kind of uh, transnational exchanges. Hi, my name is Aushra Patskochimaita. I'm a PhD candidate in public international law at the Institute for Russian and Eurasian Studies and the Faculty of Law. Thank you so much, Yekaterina, for your very interesting presentation. I have three interrelated questions, if that's okay. Uh, my first question concerns the uh, Article 15 of the Russian Constitution, which you mentioned in your presentation, and you described as the openness of Russia to international law, which was at the time rather revolutionary. And my question is, to what extent this uh, formal constitutional provision translated into practice, and how it is accepted or rejected by the uh, legal community, the judges, the lawyers, the academics in Russia? My second question, or rather comment, uh, concerns your comparison, which I appreciate, or, or I appreciate your effort to de-dramatize the situation with the Russian Constitutional Court the co and the uh, comparative perspective you take uh, on the approaches of different European courts, including the Russian Constitutional Court. However, uh, I was wondering um, to what extent do you see a good faith uh, attempt on behalf of the Russian Constitutional Court to find the balance between the national constitutional identity and the international legal obligations, given that it is the only uh, constitutional court which is legitimizing non-execution of binding judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. And the final question, <laughs> Um, is about the relationship between the Council of Europe and Russia, which has been now ongoing for more than 20 years. It's a, it's a quite long time. And uh, I was wondering, how do you assess the achievements and the challenges of this relationship and the, Russia's participation in the Council of Europe human rights system? Thank you so much. Russia, thank you very much for, uh, for the questions. Um, I, would, I will try to answer all your three questions at once. Um, and I think the, the answer is precisely that uh, uh, international law and the uh, case law of, of the Council of Europe do have a lot of impact on the Russian legal system. I mean, it has been really a very effective channel for um, harmonization in the areas covered by the convention. I don't have the numbers for compliance practices, but I mean, in so many fields, you really can observe that there is a, an effective uh, transformation um, through the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And I think precisely of this strong impact, there has been a certain move trying to kind of reshape the balance of sovereignty and uh, openness of the constitutional order. So, I mean, the, uh, the judgment I discussed um, uh, was issued on the, in the so-called so abstract norm and control. So normally, court addresses very concrete issues, 
Um, but in this case, there was an application made by, by several deputies asking an abstract question of relationship between the Russian Constitution, decisions of the ECHR, and the, uh, the obligations of the under international law. So I believe this was very political move, uh, which exactly reflects the, the, the influence and the impact of the international legal order in, in Russia. So it was kind of trying to draw back the evolution which was made in the 20 years. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I really liked um, this. Uh, you know, it's hard to understand without your explanation, but with your explanation, it was um, great. So, what I liked in particular was how it explains that universalism doesn't equal uniformity. Uh, argument that you're making um, and so you know the differences are, are really interesting and there's one um, difference in particular that I wanted to ask you to clarify so this is on the last page on the core principles of the Constitution and I found it kind of striking that in the uh, Russian case the core principle refers back to the Russian Constitution right it says um, uh, you know, if there's a collision, um, priority is given uh, to the constitutional values, which I think is qu it quite contrasts to, for example, um, you know, the Italian case where the principles of equality and solidarity are explicitly mentioned, or the UK case where we have the principle of effective democracy also explicitly mentioned, right? So, is, do you see that there is sort of a difference between the Russian case that refers back to a national legal document and, and in that sense also a national legal history and, and tradition and, and these other cases that are kind of more substantive in, in defining these core principles of the Constitution. So that's the first question. The, the, sh the second question is, is quite different and maybe I'll make it short. Um, the, the second question is basically about Ukraine. So um, Ukraine is, is, you know, that's about the second half of your presentation and Ukraine is this this place where uh, these different constitutional values have been not easily reconciled within the framework of political and legal institutions, right? Ukraine has recurrent revolutions and these sort of now quite violent conflicts over whose it, you know, culture should be allowed to be inscribed in, in national legal um, norms, but, but Ukraine is also the exception in this, in this geographical area. So why is it that there, it, you know, the, the violent concept erupts, whereas in other countries that wasn't the case? <laughs> well, uh, um, well, the 21 case by the Russian Constitutional Court was precisely criticized because of lack of clarity and its uh, reference to core constitutional principles without any clear elaboration and explanation what it is. The court refers actually to further uh, case law um, uh, in this field of interaction between Russia and uh, the Council of Europe uh, which is Markin and Anchugov, very famous cases related to um, rights of, uh, parental rights of uh, military servants. It was a male military servant who claimed his equal right for parental leave, and he went the whole uh, hierarchy up to the um, European Court of Human Rights. And the second case is Anchugov and Gladkov, which uh, deals with the um, voting rights for prisoners. So actually there is a like, kind of further background which I didn't discuss, but in this case precisely, um, the court really decides on a very formalistic grounds. So and this has been the criticism, but this also allowed actually to change the law on, on, on the compliance with the uh, international treaties. So the second question, <laughs> Um, 
I think it's uh, the geographical position of the country which matters so much. So I think the, the, um, this position of Ukraine between uh, historical East and historical West, so to say, uh, it's being in the middle of, of Europe. I think this explains a lot the difficulties of, of the transition and uh, um, contrasting models of, of further possible further development. I, this would be my understanding of the situation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of factors that seem to matter a lot in um, national legal cultures when they were translating um, sort of international law, distrust, and um, judicial practices. I wondered if you could say more about which parts of legal culture do you think are the most important uh, for variation, for, for producing variation in the translation of these transnational laws? Um, I think that areas belonging to private sphere re, re, uh, react, I must say, in a quite different way than those relating to democratic principles and uh, to governmental uh, structure. So I think this is the, the main kind of separation line of two spheres where you see really effective implementation of all uh, international documents in the world finance, uh, world uh, trade organization, and so on and so forth, and reluctance and kind of uh, very uneager implementation of principles uh, related to democracy, human rights, access to justice, and the rule of law. So I would say that you have, you see clear contrast between these two areas. Um, right, <laughs> works. So um, thank you very much, Ekaterina. Um, something that I have found interesting for quite some time is that there is l relatively little debate between people like you who study comparative international law and people who study standardization, um, soft law, open method of co uh, coordination, uh, and that kind of normative regulation. And uh, it seems to me that there would be a lot to gain for both sides to actually interact more thoroughly with each other. It seems to be occupying kind of different planets. <laughs> I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. Um, that's my simple question. <laughs> well, it's simple, but, but very kind of uh, um, deep question. <laughs> Um, well, my understanding is that law has become kind of an absolute position in regulating so many uh, fields uh, and so many areas of our life. And I think sometimes um, it substitutes politics, it substitutes any informal instruments it is substitution for moral choices, responsibility, and things like that. And I think, I mean, there's this famous book which is called Law's Empire, and I think there's a need actually, and I tried to demonstrate this, there's a need to bring back all other uh, forms of interaction and all forms of negotiation, political process, and also soft law mechanisms into the stage. Yes, it appears to me that when you talk about the cultural embeddedness of law and legal cultures, you're opening the door to those kinds of discussions that have been pursued by Marie-Laure Jelek, for example, Claudia Radaelli, and others who have studied the, the more soft forms of regulation and Absolutely. regulatory change. Thank you. Door is open again. Last day, last day of the semester. It is indeed. <laughs> Official semester so it's kind of it can is, be shorter. <laughs> yes. Um, it has been a very interesting discussion, and we just got some volunteers to continue it for a bit. So please, Ben, you go first. So, Katerina, thank you very much for making us think hard. I have a big question for you.
I wonder if, from where you stand, thinking about the relationship between domestic sovereign law and international law, if the human rights regime as an international set of norms is today becoming stronger or becoming weaker. Well, I think we do have more human rights and we have a diversity of human rights and this process of articulating particular human rights, I think, is on the way, so it's, it's progressing. Um, if we're actually entitled with more rights, it's a different question. But formally, I think, and normatively, you have more mechanisms to uh, to struggle for your rights, to express your rights. Um, on the other hand, I think there are other mechanisms which deprive your rights. So, I mean, you can be entitled, entitled formally to have access to justice or access to international courts, but um, you can be very unpowerful in some other situations related to, for example, your um, economic choices. I mean, and I think it's, it's a very complex issue, so I will need to think about this, but it's, it's a very interesting question. Thank you. It is indeed. So, Graham? Yeah, so this is a kind of a general and somewhat sort of skeptical question. I mean, uh, I sort of feel like there are moral obligations that we have, like you ought not to torture babies for fun and things like that. Generally accepted, I think. Um, there are also legal obligations, but suppose the legal obligations and your moral obligations come into conflict, what ought you to do? And it seems to me pretty clear that what you ought to do is disobey the law um, if your moral and your legal obligations come into conflict. That's what you ought to do. That's what a moral obligation is. It's kind of overriding. But if that's the case, it seems like the only reason you have for obeying the law is a prudential one, namely, if you don't obey the law, you're going to get it in the neck. Um, and the people who control the law and run the law generally are doing it um, on behalf of certain powerful entities that derive the most benefit from it. So it seems to me like there is it seems to me like the law is kind of this elaborate fiction that we generate to control people and try to make them do things that they ought not to do generally. Anyway, that's my... Well, I mean, it's a great question which has been addressed by the whole Russian literature. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think law is a fiction, and I think states are called monsters, so this is all true, but I think the, the choice between moral and legal obligations is not so simplistic. I mean, I would say the choices are not always made in favor of, or the choices are not always made when someone fears a sanction. I think the choices can be made even if someone fears a sanction in favor of moral obligation contradicting the law. That's a wonderful topic. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, Ilana. Um, actually, when you were talking of uh, or discussing the penetration of international law, 
within uh, systems of uh, national law, it seemed to me that most of naturally you were referring to European Union law. So what is the difference between European and international? Is there a, would your table of comparison look different in terms of the willingness of uh, national states to open or not to open to European law versus international law? International law is, of course, a different system of law than the EU law in a strict sense. So EU law at that time was the law of the European communities was declared uh, international legal order sui generis. So international legal order having particular characteristics. So the, the court actually adjudicating the particular character of the EU law started with the, within the international law but then developed completely unique characteristics of the EU law. So these are definitely two different systems of law. And I mean, within the EU, actually, you have but little choice to decide to comply or not to comply. So being a EU member state, you have to comply with the principles. Within the international law, you have kind of more freedom of, uh, uh, of choice and uh, the state sovereignty is still is a founding principles, principle of the European law, uh, of the international law system. So there's a clear difference between those two. Suzanne? <laughs> you, um, I'm just sort of abusing the opportunity to <laughs> talk to a Russian lawyer, so. Um, so Russia passed a, a few laws in the last, I think, two to three years that have been quite controversial um, with European and Western commentators because they've been used to um, uh, arrest uh, critics of the Putin government. And one of the laws is um, called the a Law on Religious Freedom, and it has been used to um, uh, criticize people for offending the rights of religious uh, believers in Russia. And then the other one is um, uh, on the protection of uh, children, and it's been used to um, uh, uh, arrest people who have uh, LGBT and other um, uh, non-homosexual practices in Russia. So those two laws are, in the West, clearly perceived as um, contradicting international human rights laws. So so what I'm wondering about is, is do you see the laws as a contradiction or do you see the application to the, the law in practice as a contradiction or do you not see any contradiction uh, between those national legal practices and international norms? Uh, well, I think the, the picture is actually much more complex. Uh, well, I don't have... Uh, uh, examples on the, on the first law you mentioned on religious freedom, but um, I know pretty well uh, litigation practices concerning uh, the right of LGBT people to adopt children and to have children. And the practices are really very, very controversial, like very controversial and uh, how this law is applied in practice doesn't give any uniform picture of, of what is going on. Uh, I think partly due to the fact that this kind of uh, new area or relatively new area of law and the legal practice reacts in all different ways to, to this kind of new norms. Um, I mean, law is politicized clearly. I mean, it's not neutral, but I think many things can be can be balanced or are balanced uh, through judicial practices. So I mean, like in 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 the field of uh, uh, parental rights, uh, adoption. I mean, you find like most progressive decisions, which I never expect to find, like uh, a right of a single father, for example, to adopt a child. Uh, I mean, 
it was clear an clear, clearly an exception in, in the Russian judicial practice because normally motherhood is so much protected in the Russian constitutional system. So a right of a man to adopt, not to raise, but to adopt a child uh, which was uh, uh, confirmed by actually an ordinary court in once in Moscow and one in St. Petersburg, I think gives an idea that uh, in terms of judicial practices, some, sometimes you, you find really unexpected uh, things and unexpected results. So I think it's kind of much more complex than it might look like from the outside. Yes, please. So much. If we have time, I'll take the opportunity <laughs> to ask uh, one more question. In relation to the question about international law, and of course international law according to the Russian constitution, all international treaties are binding and, and they are part of the Russian legal system. My, my, my question is, is there a difference between the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and decisions of other international human rights bodies, such as the UN Committee, in terms of their legal status in the Russian legal system and their practical effect on human rights protection in Russia? Well, uh, obviously the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights are obligatory and mandatory for the Russian federations. Concerning any other acts issued by the uh, international uh, bodies or institutions uh, of international organizations, some of them have uh, obligatory effect, but some of them have very strong uh, moral uh, uh, impact on uh, uh, development of judicial practices. So this is uh, kind of soft law Christina was, was talking about. So though the treaties do not provide for um, obligatory uh, effect of these uh, recommendations or resolutions, they do uh, uh, interact with, uh, with kind of uh, um, uh, top of, of the legal order where the main principles of international law have to be observed and to be respected. So this is more respect than actually the uh, uh, obligatory uh, force in, in pure legal terms. They are taken into account by the Russian judges, for example, or by the uh, le legislator. Uh, to what extent they are actually bi binding? To what extent they are taken into account in practice? Uh, well, uh, this is a different question how judges actually decide uh, and motivate uh, their judgments. I mean, on, on what basis they take a decision to, to do this or to do that. And um, one thing is that what they have to take into account, and there are, there are so-called um, resolutions by the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation where the Supreme Court actually gives uh, an overview of international and national uh, practices and legal practices which are kind of um, with which give strategic line for ordinary courts how to decide and how to apply a law and what kind of legal acts uh, should be taken into account but um, uh, if you look in practical terms on on comparatively on the case law i mean you can see all kinds of approaches. I mean, some judges are very well informed of uh, international regulations and re resolutions. I mean, speaking several foreign languages, some judges are not. I mean, it really depends very much on individual case, but I think like there's a clear line uh, of um, uh, like strategic application which is uh, formulated by the Supreme Court uh, in, in Russia, so that's обобщение судебной практики. So this is what you should know. Yes, please. I, I, don't, I remember that there was a debate at the United Nations between uh, uh, what is human rights in the Soviet Union and what was human rights in the West. So the, in, the, in the West it was emphasized the individual rights and in the Soviet Union it was 
supposedly the social rights, cultural rights, and I would look like, uh, has, well, my question is, have the Russians given up on those social and cultural rights? And if you ask the Chinese today, they say, well, we, we accuse the Chinese that they don't respect human rights, but they say we have given, taken out six, six, uh, 600 million out of poverty, so that is respecting their human rights. Could you comment on that? I don't know if you, do you understand what I? Um, yes, uh, well, I think that actually social sphere is my greatest concern uh, among everything what is happening in Russia. And uh, I think here you, ca you can clearly see the, um, well, first of all, the differences between the, the Soviet system of uh, rights protection and between the actual uh, state of affairs. And secondly, I think this is really the field where so much has been said and so much, so little has been done in practical terms. So I, I see this area actually is one of the most problematic areas at all. I mean, there are different uh, state programs relating to education, to financing um, schools and medical institutions, but I think in practice, um, there's a lot of discrimination and there's a lot of uh, differences in access to these rights depending on uh, you know, material status, position, um, even regions in, in Russia. So I think it's, it's, it's a very, very problematic area actually nowadays. The, the, what about the Chinese? Uh, I mean, they have protected, they claim to have protected the human rights of uh, 600 million people by taking them out of poverty. Socialism pretended to do that. And they continue with that flag of uh, trying to uh, lift up the, the people. I mean, they, okay. Some people say, well, uh, the Chinese model, okay. social democracy, but with dictatorship on top. Uh, the social, the social uh, I mean, taking the flag of having, uh, protecting the social rights. Well, it's a very, well, or better say, I can give you a very ambivalent answer to that because, I mean, um, on the one hand, I have a feeling that um, a lot of these areas like education, uh, healthcare, um, uh, other social rights like uh, protection of workers and things like that, they're often as taken to take your, your sentence as a flag to show that government is doing something for the people. But on the other hand, I think it is not included in the protection, in the equal protection of other rights. So I think the, the I mean, those things are often declared but not done in practice. So I mean, saying that you protect this, ki this number of people doesn't mean that all these uh, programs re really work in practice. So, and, and I think this is the main problem, the main issue. It's not like saying that the socialist system was better or worse, but uh, um, I think it's important that uh, so many groups of populations uh, in Russia now do not have really access to the social rights which are declared at the level of the government. Well, as for China, I think, well, I'm not an expert, but I'll be happy to discuss it with you. 
Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's one of the forms of the human rights. It's like third wave of human rights, as it's called in legal scholarship. Thank you. Tomasz? Um, I have such a general question. Uh, in the last words of your presentation, you said that law is an alternative to violence. So my question is, uh, is it a possibility to, to, to introduce law without violence or just danger of violence? And uh, the second question is, is uh, maybe, maybe law itself it's a kind of a violence? Well, law in itself is a kind of violence, you're right. But I think the yeah. ideal of law is actually Ewige uh, Frieden, so the eternal peace and good governance. So I think this, uh, that law de is developing actually always with this contradiction between striving for its ideal and actual practice, but I think it matters not only in legal fields, but in any other field as well. Mm. Okay, so if there's nobody else, um volunteering now. I, I think this is also a good way to end the seminar and actually to close the seminar series of this academic year. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, Ekaterina, for doing so in an enriching and elegant way. And thank you everyone for your contributions, not just to this seminar, but to the entire semester and academic year of seminar. Thank you. It's been very rewarding. Christina, I think I can thank you in, in the name of all the fellows for leading us for this year. And uh, I'm sure we all say thank you to Bjorn for setting up this wonderful institution. This has been very happy and very productive year, I believe, for everyone. So thank you. Thank you. you.